hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, my name is Chris Jenkins. I'm a developer advocate for Confluent, which mostly means I build stuff with Kafka and talk about it. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to build um, a live dashboard from scratch. So this is a Java meetup. I'm sure you all know about Java. Um, and we're going to be using some React and JavaScript. So um, you know roughly what that means, I'm sure. Let me give you a bit of an overview about Kafka. Um, it's a database, fundamentally. It's a, it's a novel kind of database, but you store data in it, you can query it out, it's a database. Um, but it's, it's an interesting one, I think. It's uh, a little bit like a queue. It's not a queue, but it sometimes behaves a little bit like a queuing system. It behaves a little bit like a key value store, something like AWS Dynamo or something like that, but it's not really a key value store. And it also behaves a little bit like a relational database like Oracle or Postgres, even though it's not exactly one of those either. And the way I think about Kafka is the model that fits well in my head is to think about how um, relational databases do replication these days. They pretty much all do it the same way, which is you have a primary node and every time that node gets an insert or an update or a delete statement, it just writes it to a log. It adds it to the end of the log, ships that log across to the secondary nodes. And then those secondary nodes read that log. And as each new line comes in, they process it to recreate the database. That's pretty much how all databases do replication these days. And it works. It works really well. Um, it works partly because append-only logs are really easy data structures to work with. You can, you, can, you can share them, you can spread them around very easily, you can easily find out what the new data is and send that to the secondary nodes. You never have to worry about the old data changing because it's append-only. It's a really nice data structure. And the way I think about Kafka is it's like somebody said, if we've got this append-only log of changes to the database, and it's easy to share around lots of different databases. It's easy to replicate. It's easy to scale. It's, um, it's just a very simple thing to work with. And we know that we can recreate an entire database if we start with that. So let's start with that. Let's start with a fundamental piece of architecture as an append-only log that we ship around the system and see if we can build back up um, a database from it. And you end up with this thing that looks kind of like a relational database, but has some interesting properties, including it's very good at dealing with the latest data, with live new data. So that's a feature we're going to use heavily. It's enough talking. I'm going to do some coding. Um, I have here an almost empty database, uh, empty directory, sorry. Let me just see what files we've got in. I've got, I've just started off with a Gradle build file. I'm going to use Gradle for my Java code and a properties file, which I'll walk through in a bit. And what we're going to do is imagine we've got um, a company that's running using Kafka as its database. And we have purchases coming in. This is an online store of some kind. People are buying things. We get inserts into the database of what they bought. And what I would like to try and do in the space of a lunch break-ish amount of time, in half an hour, I would like to build that out to a dashboard that everybody in the company can see. So we can all see how much money the company is or isn't making. So let's start by connecting to the database and having a look at what data we've got to work with. Now, this part, I'm going to say that somewhere off in my imaginary company, some other part of the company is worrying about inserting purchases into, purchases into the database. And I'm going to have a look at them, and I'm going to use this special emit changes directive to say, keep me informed of all the new purchases that come in live as they come in. So it looks essentially like an ordinary SQL query, except that the, it's live. There's new data coming in all the time. So how do I turn that into a dashboard? How do I turn this li living company into a sales dashboard? I'm going to start by rolling up those purchases into summary sales figures. So I'm going to create a new table. 
I'm going to call it dashboard. And I'm going to create it as a select statement. If you're familiar with SQL, this should all be very familiar code. I'm going to select the sum of the price of the thing bought as my total from purchases. And then I need to group that. I don't have a natural grouping key on this, so I'm just going to make a fake one. I'm just going to say, oh, sorry, group by sales. I'll add that as dummy column, and then we can do a valid group by query. That looks good. Now I'm just going to add one extra part to this, which I will explain in a bit. Trust me on this, it's useful to have. I'm going to say that when you create this dashboard, as you're creating it, obviously, like all relational databases, it's going to create a schema based on the column types of that source table. And I'm going to hint to the database that when it creates that schema, it should, oh, let me get my typing right. Uh, I would like it to create that schema with a special name. I don't want it to use the default name. I want it to use something that looks suspiciously like a fully qualified Java name. And with that, you can probably guess why. So I think that's my query. Let's check I've got the syntax right. Yeah. OK, so what that's doing is it's created a table, which is the sum of all the purchases. But just like the um, other table, I can select star from my dashboard and I can ask, I can watch it for new data. I can watch it for the changes. So this is a one row table, but I get to see when that one row updates. And here we go. Okay, so we have summary sales figures for this company. We could add more columns and do more interesting analysis, but I think that gets the point across. Um, I have actually worked for companies where that would be the end of the job. And they'd say, well, if the marketing people want to know what our sales figures are, they just have to learn to write an SQL query. But I think we can be a bit nicer to the rest of the company and do something a bit more accessible with that data. So let's leave KSQL there and move on to a Java project. The first thing I want to do is have that um, summary table as a Java object. And I'm not gonna write it by hand. I am going to go and talk to the database and ask it to give me the schema for that dashboard, which I can do with something like this. Um, I'm running my database locally. So I can just say, give me the versions. Okay, so there are couple of versions. Give me the latest version of the dashboard values schema. What are the what's the structure of these columns? That's a bit hard to read, so I'm going to pipe it onto JQ. Um, if you've worked with JSON, you probably know about JQ. It's a really useful tool for manipulating JSON. Uh, and if you don't, well, keep it in the back of your mind for if you ever do have to wrangle JSON. OK, so this is some metadata about that column, but the real meat of it is inside that schema key. So I'm going to have a look at that. OK, yep. OK, so I am going to pipe that little blob of JSON to source main Avro, let's say, dashboard value. AVSC is the magic extension. And now if I, by the magic of Gradle plugins, say Gradle build, you may have briefly seen generate Avro Java plugin run. And let's take that to finish wrapping up. Let's have a look. So I proved earlier that this was a basically empty directory. Let's see if we've got any new Java files. We do. There's the dashboard value. Um, so I don't have to worry about keeping Java objects and the database schema in sync. I can just automate it that way. With that in hand, let's write a web server. And because we're dealing with live, live data, I think the right choice for web server here is a web socket server. Um, 
everyone writes REST APIs, but I, WebSockets is the right choice. If, you, uh, if you're streaming live data, it's a very good choice. And if there isn't really a question coming from the end user, you just want to send them data as it comes, it's an excellent choice. So let's see. Editor to set up. So my package is going to be io.confluent.developer um, dashboard. Yeah. And incidentally, if you're interested in Kafka, do have a look at developer.confluent.io. It's uh, we recently launched it. It's a very good site for learning about it, if I do say so myself. So let's create a WebSocket server. I'm going to import a few packages. I'm going to have java.util. Who doesn't always want that? I think I know I'm going to need java.time. And I'm definitely going to need jvax.websocket. Yeah. So WebSockets in Java are pleasingly easy. I, um, I really like the way WebSockets shake out in Java. Um, sometimes I do this talk in Python. And it has its strengths and weaknesses, but WebSockets in Java are trivial. So I'm just going to def define a server endpoint, and I'm going to tell it the URI for my WebSockets. I'll just go with slash socket. That's all I need here. And then I need a function which I annotate with onopen. And that just needs to have. Um, it's going to get a session, what's called a session, which is like, you can think of it as a network connection. It's the handle to the WebSocket. So when someone connects to my WebSocket server, I will get this handle. And for now, let's just say, uh, send text, let's be utterly cliched and say, hello world. Right. With a bit of luck. Um, that should be coming from JVAX WebSocket. Uh, let's just check over here. Um, I'm going to do Gradle at start. And let's see if that builds first time. Uh, server endpoint. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's coming from um, server. There we go. That's better. Chris, I think uh, there was a question in the. Oh, let's have a so look. So it's a WebSocket. WebSocket is built in Java? Uh, yeah, it's one of the JVAX packages that probably already ships with your JDK. Um, it's not an external Ooh. library. I think they might be changing that in some version of Java. You might want to double check. Um, Just what's the current version you're using? I am. Oh, I'm on 11. I'm quite old, actually. Yeah, so then they, I don't think they would have taken it out. Yeah, I think they might. I have a feeling they changed the package name fairly recently. So you might have checked that. But yeah, the code is very much still there and available and fairly easy to use. Um, for now, I'm just not going to worry too much about exceptions. Let's just throw that and see if that will run. Chris, I had a question here. Uh, mm -hmm. How much is the schema sacrosanct in for this? Uh, because uh, in a real life situation, we will have changes. Hmm. Um, well, there. So you can easily update the table schema, um, and then you would have to. This is kind of getting into the way the schema definition works. And it's worth having a look at Avro. Avro is a bit like protobuf and it's kind of, it's the go-to encoding format, schema format in Kafka. Um, it does, it's probably going a bit too deep to go into the technical details, but it does a good job of helping you manage migrations of schema. So it can evolve. And you're going to find things like if you add new columns in the server, sorry, in the in the database, then the web server will just happily keep running. You don't have to tell it about the new columns. Ah, okay. If because you, uh, because uh, 
because I have come across Afro and I've not dig, dig, uh, dug deep into it, but I have aware of the fact that uh, Afro is one of the, you know, one of the probably preferred ways of maintaining schema in Kafka. So that's where the question came from that, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, I'll put my question more specifically. It's like uh, that you kind of answered my question that there is a way that Avro schema will automatically get reflected and the web server will not have to, you know, do something in a way that basically that build cradle, which you did can happen pretty much in real time, absorbing the changes into the schema as and when they happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, I, I would say that Avro is really a lot like protobuf. Uh, if you know Google's protobuf, with the added thing, they've done a lot of thinking about how you can evolve schemas safely. Um, and I think it does probably as good a job as can be done on that problem. So adding columns is no problem. Removing columns, you're going to need a default value. Otherwise, um, things will certainly yeah. disappear. But it does a good job, and it's worth it diving into more outside of this talk. Sure, sure. Thank you very much for that. So hopefully we've got a WebSocket server running. And another great tool to put in your tool belt is WS, which I'm guessing you've all heard of curl for doing HTTP requests. WS is one of those go-to things in your tool belt for doing WebSocket requests. So I'm just going to see if my WebSocket server works. Hello world, yes, okay. So, that's it. That's how much Java code you need to get a basic WebSocket server going, plus the Gradle plugin. I think that's pretty cool. So we need to make this say more than hello world. We need it to connect to the database and start um, sending sales updates. So how do we do that? I'm going to sketch this out and then we'll fill in the details. So. With Kafka, you, your database connection kind of splits in two in an interesting way. You have um, split writers and readers, and they're called producers, which create new data to put into the database, and consumers, which read it out. And it's probably getting, I, I won't go into the nuances of why they're split, but I'll just say they are split for this talk. And if you want to read, you need to create a consumer. It's an interface and I'm going to create it using a new Kafka consumer. Kafka consumer. It's going to take some properties. So let's set up a properties object. And we will worry about populating that in a second. Once I've got a consumer, the first thing I'm going to do is tell it to subscribe to a collection of tables, streams, topics, these log things that we're interested in hearing news about. So I'm going to get it to subscribe to one thing, singleton list of my dashboard table. And last I checked, my editor was struggling with static imports. So I'm going to import this one manually. Uh, Java.util.collections or uh, singleton list. There we go. Right. Um, we need a key and a value. My key is just um, going to be the string sales. My value is dash dashboard value. Okay. And generics, generics, generics. I... Okay. Um, and then I'm going to import everything from consumer there. Okay. Uh, so once I've got my consumer, things are pretty easy. I'm going to go into effectively an endless loop with a classic while running pattern and tell that consumer to call for changes every uh, 200 milliseconds. Should be fine, right? that polling command will return zero or more uh, consumer records. And then I'm just going to iterate through those records. And I'm going to do something that we've already seen. I'm going to take the session. Oh, no, I want the basic remote. And 
I'm going to send that record value serialized to a string. That is basically the right shape of my code, I think. I'm going to stick some generics in. Reformat. Uh, yeah, I haven't set up running. So let's jump into that classic I'm dealing with Java threads pattern of running equals false. I'm going to stick in an on close handler that is going to ignore any arguments and just say this dot running is false. And then I best set it running, let's say here. OK. That's starting to look of the right shape. Um, what's the next part I need to do? I think I need to load some properties. So let's get an input stream and load that config file. Um, let's see. Let's just do get resources stream. Uh, desktop properties, I called it. That should load it from my uh, class path source main resource file. Then I can say properties dot load that config and uh, make sure we close the config because we're good people. Which reminds me, speaking of closing things, I think we should put this in a try finally block and close the consumer when we're done. that's looking all right. I don't know why my editor's complaining about the dashboard value, um, but I'm sure it's available. So how does that look? We have loaded the properties file, which let's have a quick look at the properties file, because that's one of the files I gave myself for free when we started this code. Um, it's, it's not wildly interesting, which I think is a good thing. Um, like any database connection, file is largely boilerplate. We're telling it how to connect to the database and where to find the schema for data. We're giving it some information about deserializing um, bytes from the network, um, which that is also one of. And then that actually applies to writers. I can take that out. Um, I'll leave that on screen for a second. But it's basically one of those config files you copy and paste the first time your new project connects to a database. So we have this code. It's not perfect yet, but it's getting there. When we open, we're going to read the properties file. We're going to connect our consumer, subscribe to the dashboard, and watch for records that we can send to the client. I think we need one more thing. And it's uh, a nuance, one of those nuances I'm going to touch on, but and invite you to learn more about. Um, one thing Kafka is also really good about really good at is as you're spreading this data around through these what amount to replication logs, you're often in a position where you've got large amounts of data spread across lots of machines. And Kafka is very good at letting you say, well, sometimes I want to have one machine processing data for some reason, but sometimes I want to have a cluster of readers sharing that work of processing. Um, so it becomes very easy to say, I want to join a group of readers. And you might have a group called, um, you might have those sales coming through, you might have a group called warehouse that processes each sale and um, sends that and actually starts going through the warehouse to manage getting that order processed. Um, and you, obviously in a large company, that should be more than one machine. So you might have five, 10 Java processes or sharing the warehouse group. And when you do that, each process, for each task will only go to one of those machines. In our case, we don't actually need that feature. We want every user to see every dashboard record, every connection. So I'm just going to create a random group ID using the king of random string generators, a UUID. I think with that, it's time to see why this doesn't compile. So let's have a look. Uh, oh, 
send, yes, I've done that wrong. I put send instead of send text. Let's try again. It's looking promising. Okay. Oh, no, I've already got another terminal. So let's see what happens when I connect to that WebSocket now. Ah, there we go. Can you see that okay? It's streaming in totals. Um, it's formatted as JSON, which we get for free from the auto-generated Avro class. That's looking like something that a Java, a JavaScript web, um, web page could just connect straight to and read. Just see if there are any questions at that point. Yeah, uh, you are streaming it directly in the web application, but will not will it not have the performance impact like Sovik said? If I have a huge set of data changes, uh, this will be a performance hit, right? Because there will be a lot of communication. Yeah, so um, there are a couple of things to deal with there. Um, so performance-wise, on the database side, when you're rolling up that list of changes, it, it's not like um, it's not like a full table scan in in some databases that dashboard table will process one record at a time and do one update at a time. Um, it, it's, uh, it's an order one constant time operation. So maintaining that dashboard table in the database is very cheap. Now for reading here, there are a few things you can do. You can redefine that table so that it only emits changes, it sort of batches things up into a window if you want. You could get more clever than this code about having a separate thread that does all the reading and then spins it out to um, Java processes. Um, and that would give, give you only one database handle. I haven't done that just because the way the code comes out, it becomes larger than you can really get through in a talk. Uh, there's one other thing that just came into my mind about that. Uh, and also it's worth noting that if, if you're Amazon, then yeah, you're going to get hundreds of thousands of sales a day, um, uh, an hour, and that would be a genuine performance concern. But what we're really talking about here is a very cheap pointer into a, every client has a pointer into a log file, which is very cheap. And every time there's a new row, it sends a short string of data across the wire, which is very cheap. So even this simplified version, I would expect to scale pretty well on its own. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was a question, Chris, around the group ID which was said. Is it the consumer group configuration? Uh, yeah, that yeah, that sets your consumer group. It's okay. going to dynamically create the consumer groups because it's one session. Um, yeah, it, it, you tell it which consumer group you're in, and if it hasn't heard of that, that's fine. It just creates a new one automatically. In fact. Logically, you could think of um, a consumer group as just like a name badge almost, um, or a shared name badge at least. It's quite a lightweight thing, I think it's fair to say. So what would be the benefit, Chris, of this consumer group uh, when you're publishing the dashboard just to make sure it's... Uh, you know. oh, so for, for this case, um, it's... I wouldn't say there's any benefit. Um, you are just uniquely identifying yourself to the database. Um, but because Kafka's built kind of from the ground up for scaling, there is an assumption that you might want to be in a group of readers sharing a workload. So even if you're just on your own, you have to identify yourself. You have to say, this is my group, it's just me. Okay. And so uh, every time, basically, you go ahead, Sandy. Yes, so, sorry. so in production, like uh, you're not allowed to create dynamically consumer groups, right? Uh, no, you can. You can. I don't think that you'd be yeah. stopped from doing that. Uh, not for you... this Kafka capable and also for the regular consumers as well? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it'd be any problem in, I mean, you might have a maintenance, um, you might have a DevOps thing you want to keep an eye on mm -hmm. if you create a lot of these. Yeah. yeah. But certainly you're not restricted from creating um, consumer groups. Because I can think of like, if there are too many users logged in, um, there will be too many consumer groups being created, so that could be a problem. 
Because the yeah, zoo people now you have to track tens and thousands of consumer goods where they are their offsets are. Yeah, um, I, I think it depends on what size of company and what number of consumers you're dealing with. I'm thinking this is an internal dashboard where um, you'd be lucky to have 10,000 employees, much less <laughs> 10,000. Yeah, yeah, in that case, makes sense. Yeah, I think you would engineer it differently if this was um, like public facing system. And the main thing you'd probably do is have a fixed group ID and a separate class that manages the readers. Um, but I think the thing that's nice about this is how quickly you can throw up something that's internally very useful. Um, you could genuinely build something like this in a lunch break, and I hope I will have you convinced by the end that we'll see something that's genuinely useful for the whole company to be looking at. So, are we done? I think I'm going to add one thing to this. I, I'm bothered that this on open handler doesn't close until we've actually finished running. I think what I'd like to do is have the consumer running in a separate thread per user, and that way it won't block the on open call. I think that's good housekeeping. So what I'm going to do is wrap this all in a new thread block. Um, this will do. There are a few ways to spin this out to a separate thread, but I think this will be fine. Uh, let's do that. And I think I'm going to need uh, I'm going to need to be able to catch IO exceptions here. And I think for the sake of time, I will just print stack trace on them. That should be fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. Let's just check. <clears throat> so do we still have? Yeah. And so to perhaps as a demonstration, I'm going to start a second WebSocket connection here. And it should see exactly the same values because it's own in its own unique consumer group. Yeah, so I've got I've got two people connecting and they're all see, seeing each update. If they had the same consumer group ID, you'd expect that update to go to one or other of those windows. But that's not the behavior I want. So I think we're done on that. We've got one more step to go. You're still with me. So I need a client and if you don't do front end work, I hope you'll find this fun. I'm going to start with MPX create react app and just call it client for now. So that's a node program that will download a react template for me. It will take a couple of minutes. Let's see if there's any. Um, let's see if there's anything in the comments. Great session. Good part is that we can try this very quick. Yeah, I hope so. I am. Um, I wrote something like this years ago at um, a gold trading company. It was a startup. And we, we really wanted to know how, because we were a startup, right? We really wanted to know if we were selling anything at all. Um, but we didn't have, because we were a startup, we didn't have that many people, uh, that much engineering time. So I hacked together a fairly nasty <laughs> dashboard, um, which wasn't much more than an SQL query that spat out HTML and people would mash the refresh button and they would see the latest figures. Uh, and it scaled really horribly because um, by the time we'd actually sold hundreds and thousands of things, that full table scan was, was a nightmare. But, but yeah, the point is, it's use to see what your sales figures are live is useful, interesting data. And if you can knock that together in a lunch break, you can you can knock together a lot of interesting internal statistics in a lunch break. That's the whole point of this. So this really takes a while, doesn't it? Creating a React app. It's um I should have done that. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Oh, no, I thought it was done. I was wrong. It's still got one more step. Uh, yeah. 
I am not going to have a look at the size of the downloads module. Um, but we're almost there, I'm sure. Uh, so Chris, to divert attention this, but... for a few minutes, uh, if, if, if yeah. people are interested in the theoretical aspects of around consumer groups and stuff like that, uh, any suggestions? Because I don't see a point in discussing, uh, you know, concepts of uh, you know, theoretical concepts which can be read better in documentation here. Yeah. Um, I think I think the to to give it the high level elevator pitch, as they call it. Um, I think what's really interesting about Kafka is it's a database and it's really good with what's the latest piece of data. So if you have any use cases where live data is genuinely more valuable than old data, or perhaps really poignantly interesting, it's not that you lose the old data, but you do have a specific interest in what's new, what's happening which is something that comes up everywhere, like um, order processing in a company, sales figures, um, who's signed up to a meetup, you know, and anything where new information is particularly interesting information. Kafka is a very useful database. And I would thoroughly recommend taking a look at developer.confluent.io to get started. We have loads of guides if you want to do, if you just want to get started with your favorite language, um, we have that. If you want to learn more about how Kafka works or you want to go in depth with it, it's a great site. And I'm only slightly biased because I contributed some of the code to it. Okay, we have a React app. Is everyone ready to switch, um, switch mode to JavaScript? We're almost there. Let me um, uh, here, client source app. So I'm not going to do anything amazing with JavaScript, but that's kind of the point. Um, if you're not a front-end developer, I think you'll look at this and think, mm, I could knock that up during my lunch break. I could do something this complicated. So let's have a look at this React app. Maybe we'll split the screen like this. So the way React works, to give you the high-level overview, is actually a lot like the way Kafka works. You get new data coming in and maybe you do something to roll it up to give um, an interesting summary of that piece of data and then you just have to find a way to spit that summary out to the screen so what we're going to do is watch for those um, totals coming in in our case we're just going to keep hold of the latest and we're going to render it out as html and to do that the first thing we need to do is to find some state on this reactor so there's a function called use state. And to begin with, I'm going to be ultra basic and just make it the um, string loading, because that's how we're going to start up. And use state returns two things. It returns the current value of that piece of state and a setter. So I'm going to say that. And then if I import use state from React, and the last thing to do is I will take out this HTML link. Uh, I'll take out that too. And I'll just do um, a header tag with that message. If you know any HTML, I think that's going to look very simple. And that's the syntax for getting value into it. Yeah, so you can see that up at the top. We are loading. OK, how do we deal with our WebSocket? There are a few ways to skin that cat, but I'm going to say, I'm going to do it this way at the time. Let's define our WebSocket URL as ws colon slash slash localhost 8080 slash socket, which is what we defined partly in the Gradle file, the port, and then slash socket we did in our server endpoint annotation. Then over here, I'm going to say, let's use a piece of state, which is a new WebSocket, connecting to that URL. And that will give me reference to the current WebSocket and a setter. Might not actually need. Okay, that should give me a WebSocket. Um, now, WebSockets have, in JavaScript, they have event handlers. So you can say, take this WebSocket, and when you get a message, 
give me that message event and run some code. What code should we run? For now, let's just check everything's wired up correctly and just say, got that event, okay? Now, a bad thing about um, creating a React app is it takes ages to get started, but a nice thing is it does create it with an automatic reloading thing. So we can already see we've got some of these total messages streaming through. It's a message event. There's a data property, and that's a string of JSON. So let's grab that. Let's say our, um, our payload is json.parse event.data. Okay. And then we can update our logging to hopefully spit out. Uh, oh. Yeah, there we go. That's spitting out Java objects with a key called total and the value we care about. We are almost done. Let's use um, set message on payload total and convert that to a string, maybe. I think. And there we go. There is our dashboard. Now, obviously, we could have defined the um, summary table in uh, our KSQL prompt to have more fields and more interesting data. We would have had um, a newly newly defined ge automatic generated bean in the Java. Wouldn't have changed our coding at all, I don't think. And then we'd have extra fields over here. But the point is, I think, we call that half an hour of coding, and there is a business KPI type summary I can stick in front of anyone in the company. I can just give them a URL, I can email it around internally, and everyone can now see our sales figures, which I think is pretty cool. Should we just do one more thing to make this fun? I'm going to say, um, let's do a formatted version of it. And let's say dollar symbol, instead of converting it to a string, convert it to a localized string. Um, I am English, so I'm going to go for EN. And let's say min, if I can remember this, minimum fraction digits of two. And then uh, change that to formatted. And hopefully, there we go. So we've got a dollar symbol and a comma, and we'll always get two zeros there. I think that's done. So um, before I take questions, sum this up. Uh, if you're um, if you're mostly a Java programmer, I hope that shows you that creating WebSocket servers is easy um, and it's the right choice for live streaming data. If you're as a Java group, if you're not front end people, uh, it can get pretty complex the front end. But I hope that makes you think I could do some simple stuff very easily. Um, I hope that gives you if you've been put off the front end but curious about putting data in front of people. Um, I hope that gives you the confidence to give it a try. And obviously, you know, I, if you're um, working with real-time data sources and you can see the value of being able to see things as they happen, I hope you'll check out Kafka at developer.confluent.io. And at that point, I will take questions. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, it was a great session. Uh, I have a very general question about Kafka. Uh, uh, you mentioned this interesting point. You mentioned that Kafka is kind of a database, as well as you mentioned that it is more about live data. So I am interested in the database part. Uh, I'm just talking about very small startup companies where I practically face this problem. Consider they are using MySQL and they want to mm -hmm. do some reporting. I introduce them Elasticsearch, okay? For a corporate, it's okay. But if I'm introducing them Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch needs at least three nodes to uh, give that uh, scalability, high availability and all this stuff. Similarly, I'm saying live data, you use Kafka also. Kafka also needs its own infrastructure in terms of number of nodes alone I'm talking about. But the point that you mentioned is Kafka can be used as a database also. So do you think Kafka can be used as a real-time database? In that case, it adds value to even startup companies, right? Small companies. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think genuinely it can. Um, all these questions come with the caveat that let's have a specific look at your use case, right? But um, 
you can build uh, Kafka is definitely should be on your short list of database uh, choices. You can run it on one node. You can very easily run it on the cloud, um, which is I should plug Confluent Cloud, which is a very easy way to get started um, with with a managed Kafka service. But you can run you can run it locally for development. You can run a Docker image, um, one of many options. You've got um, you've got uh, KSQL, which I showed, which is really feels like a traditional SQL prompt um, at a relational database. It's not exactly the same, but it's it's SQL compatible, and it gives you um, a lot of querying power. In some ways, more querying power. In some ways, you've got to wrangle it a little bit, but um, uh, yeah, so I think- it transactional support also? Uh, yes, it supports transactions, um, uh, including things like exactly once processing, which can be very useful. Um, if you're doing things like uh, order processing, you want each order to be process processed exactly once, it can do that kind of thing. Um, there are separated uh, readers and writers, so you can scale them separately. Um, yeah, I think it, it's a perfectly viable database that's especially good if you've got data that, if you've got a use case where live data is particularly interesting. Um, which is not to say you can't query old data, you can. It's just, this is a extra bonus headline feature you get. Uh, it's also worth mentioning something called Kafka Connect, which is a system for getting data into and out of Kafka. So you can very easily connect Kafka to Elasticsearch if you want to for free text searching, or you could connect it to Postgres for some kind of um, summary reporting, maybe in the analytics department, if you wanted to. You could do it in KSQL. You could do it that way. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of Swiss Army knife of connecting Kafka to other databases. Oh, thanks. Uh, folks, there's a Kafka meetup group uh, which Ina has shared the URL. So, for people who are more interested in following more on what's happening in Kafka, I'm sure it can be a good source of learning with the community uh we'll post it in you can post it in the meetup uh, chat as well Ina, so that it's available 